Hello, lovelies. So sometimes things sneak up on you so slowly that you don't even really notice until there's some inciting event or change in your circumstances. And that draws a big red line under the changes. Well, I just moved recently and had to get a new phone number for my new area. And my old phone with the old number didn't work any more. Well, without roaming, right? (laughs) And I found out the hard way that even then, with roaming... It was not foolproof. This meant, among other things, that I could not use my bank. I could not pay my credit card bill. I could not watch a movie on Prime. I couldn't advertise on Facebook. I couldn't even buy my friend's new book on Amazon that he released just the other day. All of this was, of course, um, for my own safety It was because of that damn two-factor authentication. All of a sudden, I needed my old phone to pay a bill. Like, who on earth is going around breaking into people's accounts to pay their bills? (sighs) Please, break in and pay mine, please. For my safety, they say. And I'm so sick of hearing that. All of a sudden, I'm not capable of making my own decisions about my own safety. But of course, none of it is about my safety. All of it is the influence of Ariman. So last time I introduced uh, the concept of Rudolf Steiner's eighth sphere, in his own words, it is an eighth sphere over and above the seven which constitute the domain of the ordered and regular evolution of mankind. In other words, the eighth sphere is a sphere that is an aberration on the path of human evolution. How was it created? Well, without going into the complicated minutia of Steiner's explanation, he basically says that Lucifer and Araman created it by stealing a spiritual element required for our evolutionary process, diverting it for their own purpose. Where is it exactly? Well, it's right here. As Steiner says, the eighth sphere is not something new. It already exists, interpenetrating and being connected to physical reality. Its effect on and its role in evolution, however, is emerging and becoming ever more apparent. He also said... If the eighth sphere is to be described, it must obviously be described as a realm in which we are living all the time. Unconsciously, he's always within it, just as we are always within the air, even if we are not aware of it. Unless, of course, if we have imaginative visionary clairvoyance, then you can see it. But I can't see it because I don't. (laughs) But boy... Can I feel it? So let me go a little bit deeper today in who Lucifer and Araman. We'll dive into them a little bit more. Within spiritual science, Steiner used the names Lucifer and Araman to designate two adversarial opposing forces. Netas, if you want to go ancient Egyptian, or cosmic principles, if you like, which can be envisaged as beings that we encounter in order to develop freedom. Now, I know that might sound curious, but they are the salt within the oyster that enables the growth of the pearl. At least that's the plan. Here is a beautiful quote by Henry Barnes. Steiner describes unseen beings who tempt and waylay us in two very different directions. On one side, there are servants of Lucifer, the fallen angel of light. They are beings who have brought humanity great gifts, but who would abandon the goal of the highest hierarchies and create a blissful kingdom of spiritual light and delight for themselves. On the other side, there are immensely powerful beings who strive to blind us to the spirit, powers for whom it is self-evident that the universe is a machine and that what can be measured, weighed, and quantified 
is the only reality. These spirits of materialism belong to the dark power that ancient wisdom called Araman. Now, even though I've been talking about this whole materialistic prison paradigm thing, I had forgotten that, gosh, years and years ago, I had purchased a book called The Book of Lies, The Disinformation Guide to Magic and the Occult. And it's actually signed by Richard Metzger. This is when I just met Chance. It was probably around the year 2000. And in it, he has a essay called The Occult War. And in that essay, he discusses the likes of Lucifer and Araman and whoever this is who wrote this, Robert Mason did a wonderful job. So I'm going to read you a little bit about Lucifer and Araman as described by Robert Mason, who is essentially mm, summarizing Steiner. The Luciferic beings try to draw mankind away from the normal Earth evolution to their own abnormal psychic spiritual cosmos of light. In the human soul, they inspire pride, egotism, disinterest in one's fellow man, fiery emotionalism, subjectivity, fantasy, and hallucination. In the human intellect, they inspire generalization, unification, hypothesizing, and the building of imaginative pictures beyond reality. Human speech and thought are Luciferic in origin. So are human self-consciousness and the capacity for independence and rebellion against the normal God's world order. Also, the susceptibility to disease originated from Luciferic influence. A high spiritual being, in a sense the leader of the Luciferic host, Lucifer himself, incarnated in a human body in the region of China in the 3rd millennium BC. The event brought about a revolution in human consciousness. Before then, men could not use the organs of intellect and lived by a kind of instinct. Lucifer was the first to grasp by the intellect the wisdom of the mysteries, theretofore revealed by the gods to mankind in other forms of consciousness. The effect of this incarnation inspired the wisdom of pagan culture up through the gnosis of the early centuries AD and lingered even into the early 19th century. This wisdom should not be considered to be false in itself. It is good or evil depending on who holds it and for what purpose it is used. The great pagan initiates took it upon themselves to enter into the Luciferic influence and turn it to the good of mankind. Only through the Luciferic influence has mankind risen above the status of childishness. Apart from the pagan culture of nature wisdom was the Hebraic culture which, in a sense, separated the man from nature and which prepared an hereditary current to provide a body for the incarnation of Christ. In pagan culture, the man felt membered into the starry cosmos without what we now know as moral impulses. Moral impulses in the human soul were prepared by Hebrewism and furthered by Christianity. Christianity is also a culmination and fulfillment of pagan wisdom. Here, Christianity means not so much organized religion as the deeds and continuing influence of the Christ being and his hosts, not necessarily confined to formal religious organizations. A third spiritual influence working into human and earthly evolution is the Aramanic. The intention of Araman and his hosts is to freeze the earth into complete rigidity so that it will not pass over to the Jupiter, Venus, and Vulcan ages, and to make the man into an entirely earthly being, unindividualized, unfree, and divorced from the normal God's cosmos. I'm just going to stop for a second. Remember, there are seven stages of earthly evolution, and uh, we're in the earthly stage, and if we were to evolve naturally, we would pass into the Jupiter stage, Venus, and Vulcan ages. 
So that's what he's referring to there. The essential aromatic tendency is to materialize, to crystallize, to darken, to silence, and to bring living mobile forces into fixed form. In other words, to kill that which is living. This tendency in itself within proper bounds is not evil. The dead material world is necessary for the regular God's plan of human and cosmic development. The aromatic tendency is evil only when it exceeds proper bounds, when it reaches into what should be alive, and Araman does try to exceed proper bounds. Again, the basic reality of the world is spiritual beings together with their deeds, but Araman promotes the illusion, the lie, that matter is the basic reality or the only reality. Or the only reality. In fact, Aramanic spirits, not atoms or ultimate particles, are the reality behind the apparently material world. Araman lives upon lies. He is a spirit of untruth, the father of lies. In the present fifth cultural epoch, the Aramanic influence in human culture is reaching a climax. The modern science now, and this was, <laughs> and this was written twenty years ago. The modern scientific revolution since the fifteenth century has been inspired largely by Araman. He is the inspirer of amoral, atheistic, mechanistic materialism, and the kind of cleverness that goes with it. The regular gods intent for the present epoch, also called also called the Consciousness Soul Epoch, is that mankind should develop increased consciousness together with the individuality and spiritual freedom that go with that consciousness. Araman opposes this. He wants the man to live from unconscious instincts as an unindividualized, impulsive animal, clever, but an animal nonetheless. Araman is the teacher of the lie that man is an animal. Darwinism and similar theories. Doesn't that sound like our good buddy Yuval? Klaus's friend, eh? He must be a student of Ariman. To the modern mind, it might seem a contradiction to say Ariman opposes increased consciousness but promotes intelligence and science. This is because the modern mind is so immured in what is generally considered to be scientific thinking that it has almost no conception of the true nature of conscious thinking. The truth is that the scientific, quote-unquote, thinking, normal in this epoch, no matter how clever, is hardly conscious at all, possibly with some relatively rare exceptions at the moment of insight or mathematical discovery. In the kind of consciousness usual in our scientific culture, we become conscious only of the fixed results of the thinking after it has been accomplished. We are not usually conscious of the thinking process itself. And since it is unconscious, it is not our free action. It is automatic. When we think in the manner usual in our epoch, we are sentient automata, acting from instinct. And this is what Araman wants. He wants to stamp out all traces and all possibility of free, individualized human consciousness. He wants the man not to be an individual, but only a member of a general species of pseudo man of pseudo mankind to be a clever earthbound animal, a humunculus. As indicated, Araman is the inspirer of the most extreme kind of scientific materialism, the doctrine that there is no spirit or soul in the world, that life itself is not, in fact, alive, but is only a complex of mechanical processes, that reality is at base only quantitative, and that there is no reality in qualitative, color, sound, etc., even that the human inner being is a confluence of material forces. On the emotional level, he works in the human subconscious. On the emotional level, he works in the human subconscious instincts, inspiring fear, hatred, lust for power, and destructive sex impulses. 
and the desire to keep everybody safe on the internet. That was me. I added that. On the mental level, he inspires rigid, automatic thinking, thinking almost entirely without thoughts, but thinking tremendously strongly in the language, in the literal word, which easily becomes empty words, which in turn easily becomes lies. This abstract thinking is devoid of any conscious interactivity and devoid of any real connection to living experience and creates a darkened consciousness without light, color, or images. But I tell you what it does create with light, color, or images. It creates the metaverse. Steiner explains that the ultimate goal of the Aramanic powers is to draw as much of humanity into the eighth sphere as is possible. If you imagine a future where people's minds are permeated, connected through entanglement to a quantum internet, controlling all aspects of life, both real and virtual, the virtual made up from countless imaginative universes almost indistinguishable from physical reality, then you will have some idea of how the human will be controlled and over time destroyed as the human being is incorporated into this eight sphere of being. If we just look around the world right now, so many people walk around with their heads in another world already. Their legs are still walking on the earth, but their attention is elsewhere. The screens of their mobile phones are a portal to another place, a world in which their virtual self, a carefully constructed version of who they wish to be for the other's online perceivers, a carefully crafted version of who they wish to be for other online perceivers, takes on even more characteristics chosen by the creator of the avatar. (laughs) So now what I'd like to do is to read you just a few quotes from some magazines um, that have been collected in an article that I will post for you below that also did a fantastic job at looking at this subject. But here's just a few for you, for your consideration. The metaverse is the next version of the internet, but instead of static web pages, it will thrust you into an immersive game-like world. Think of the metaverse like a massive virtual world where you can go to work, learn, create art, shop, watch concerts, hang out with friends, and do dozens of other real-life activities. From Forbes magazine, welcome to the metaverse. New worlds are in the making. Calvin's world is in the making. Tamara's world is in the making. Sam and Joe's world is in the making. And you're invited, says Meta themselves. Everything will be digitalized, which can be digitalized, says our dear friend Klaus Schwab. What we are really doing is building an augmented version of reality, says Eric Schmidt, Google CEO. Zoltan Isfan is one of the world's most prominent transhumanists, said, The world will be run by AI networks and networks of quantum intelligence. Nations will have ceased to exist as independent physical entities because they will be online and have all merged as one. Humans may exist, but they will be put off the AI grid and contributing very little to progress and what is happening to the world. So, as I mentioned last time, we are not the only ones thinking about (laughs) this eight sphere. And one of the things that I found just absolutely crazy in this whole deep dive down is that there is this very complicated storyline about (sighs) Rudolf Steiner, Madame Blavatsky, and Alice Bailey. And Alice Bailey, who you may remember, was the creator of the Lucius Trust. 
You may remember or you may know <laughs> that Alice Bailey was a writer of more than 24 books on theosoph on theosophical subjects and she published those books under the company name the Luch Luch's Trust and what's super interesting is if you go to the Luch's Trust which I'll do right now the Luch's Trust has become an NGO an NGO that resides at the UN. And um, the Luchas Trust has two of its major contributors happen to be George Soros and who's our dear friend that started Microsoft? Bill Gates. <laughs> but what's really, really interesting here is they – on the website somewhere, they talk about the name, the changing of the name of the Luchas Trust, and <laughs> on the history page, they say a, a publishing company initially named Lucifer Publishing Company was established by Alice Bailey and Foster Bailey in 1922 to publish the book Initiation, Human and Solar, The Ancient Myth of Lucifer, refers to the angel who brought light into the world, and it is assumed that the name was applied to the publishing company in honor of a journal which had been edited for a number of years by theosophical founder H.P. Plavatsky. It soon became clear to the Baileys that some Christian groups have traditionally mistakenly identified Lucifer with Satan, Lucifer with Satan, and for this reason the company's name was changed in 1924 to the Luchas Publishing Company. Now, that all aside, for a moment, <laughs> we've spoken a little bit about the Luciferian currents, and we've spoken a little bit about the aromatic currents that we see moving, that we see evident in our world today. But I just want to even go one step further, which is a little bit even crazier, which is even a little bit more of a rabbit hole. So Rudolf Steiner and other super sensible researchers explain how the workings of Lucifer and Araman are connected with the forces of man-made electricity and magnetism, the polarities that information processing technologies are based upon. It is not as simple as Lucifer solely being connected with that electricity and Araman magnetism. More research is required on this subject. Thinking of electricity as infinitely compressed light and magnetism as infinitely compressed sound is, however, helpful. At the center of the United Nations headquarters meditation room in New York sits a massive magnetic altar from the magnetic iron ore made from magnetite iron ore. The former UN Secretary General described it as a meeting of the light of the sky and the earth. It is the altar to the gods of all. In a book from Gond Hishasper to Silicon Valley, God knows if I pronounce that even anything like it. <laughs> Paul Emerson explains in great deal that quantum computers work by exploiting certain characteristics of the eighth sphere. He says, imagine a future time when the internet is a quantum internet and much of our technology uses quantum-based processes. As strange as it may sound, the processing will not be taking place within the physical hardware, but rather the physical hardware will create a condition where the processes may access and utilize the parallel non-physical dimensions of our reality, of our reality system known as the eighth sphere. CERN is another device that, according to the project, scientists could be accessing other dimensions. It could be seen in some ways as a single giant qubit. Out of this door might come something, or we might send something through it, says the director of research at CERN. 
suffice it to say, as I mentioned in the last podcast, we're not the only ones that are thinking about the eighth sphere, about exploiting the eighth sphere, about moving us into the eighth sphere. But let me end on something that Rudolf Steiner said. If everything were to run without a hitch for Lucifer and Araman, if they were everywhere able to rest as much as they rest from the organ of the head, Earth evolution would soon reach a point where Lucifer and Araman could succeed in destroying our Earth and in leading over all evolution of worlds into the eighth sphere so that Earth evolution as a whole would take a different course. Hence, Lucifer endeavors to unfold his greatest strength of all at the place where man is the most vulnerable, namely in his head. In summary, then, as I've said before, Steiner's words at, in his time must have sounded like sci-fi. And to be honest with you, Steiner's words today even sound totally far out. But when seen in the light of current and future technological developments, they stand as a clear warning of a terrible future that awaits humanity if we continue to blindly follow our current course of technological development. And if we continue, as I keep pounding on, and if we continue, as I keep pounding on, to believe that our only reality is our materialistic prison paradigm, denying the reality of anything beyond our senses. The eighth sphere is not something new. It already exists. Its effect on and its role in evolution, however, is emerging. It is emerging in terms of our two-factor authentication by the fact that we can't do anything without our mobile phones, by the fact that we're going to have to have some kind of digital pass to be a citizen of the future, the fact that people are integrating microchips into their bodies, the fact that education of our children is being introduced to prepare them for this kind of future online. The fact that they're trying to get rid of cash. All of these things are aramanic influences and all of them are something that we can actually do something about if we want to. Thank you for listening, lovelies. And if you like this podcast and would like to support us, please go to MagicalEgypt.com and I have made a special discount coupon just for you all. And the coupon code is LOVE. And that will get you $30 off any Magical Egypt purchase. Also, um, I've started a Patreon. So you can mosey on over there and uh, see if you want to contribute. But I appreciate you listening and I appreciate all your support. And more soon.